Thank you very much. It's a treat to, to be here for Green Build in this intimate setting. Um, I'm going to do something tonight that I um, haven't done for a while. I've been, as Kofi said, working on uh, the whole question of America right now. So I can't hear. I'll stay, stay by the microphone. Okay. All righty. I'm going to do something uh, tonight that I really haven't done uh, for a while, and that's talk about the green issue, because I've been working on the question of America uh, for the last couple of years, its fate and future. And as I've come back to think about this issue, I thought the best thing I could do tonight is give you a sense of, as I see it, the political, the geopolitical, economic, and values context that's shaping the world in which you're trying to do your business. Now, when I think of the fix we're in today, at least in America, economically, and that the world is in environmentally, two images come to my mind. The first is a cartoon that ran in The New Yorker in the winter of 2011. It showed an elderly man meeting with his banker. The caption underneath, had the man saying to the banker, I want to take out one of those mortgages on my grandchildren's future. That little cartoon summed up not only how we have behaved in the past, but how much damage we can still do to our future if we don't change course and bring both our climate spending and deficit spending under control. We have literally been mortgaging our children's future by simultaneously consuming so many natural resources faster than their replacement rate and consuming so many financial resources without replacing them at all. We need to change course quickly. The stakes could not be bigger, and that brings to mind the other image. It's a famous scene in Orson Welles' 1958 film, Touch of Evil, about murder, kidnapping, conspiracy, and corruption in a town on the Mexican-American border. Wells plays a crooked cop who tries to frame his Mexican counterpart for murder. At one point, Wells stumbles into a brothel and finds the proprietor, Marlene Dietrich, who is also a fortune teller, with cards spread out in front of her. Read my future for me, Wells says. You haven't got any, she replies. Your future is all used up. That does not have to be our fate. Our future does not have to be all used up economically or environmentally, provided though we fix what needs fixing today, right now, and get on a more sustainable growth path in both the market and Mother Nature. And that's what I want to talk about this evening. The similarities between how we have been behaving in the natural world and how we have been behaving in the financial world and what we need to do to put both on a more sustainable footing. Now, we didn't get into this situation overnight. And that's why my talk tonight is going to be built around several key years, 1979, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011. Each one represents something very important, in my view, for the environment in which all of you are trying to promote your cause or do your business. So let's start with 1979. I know it's a long time ago. Many of you probably weren't even born then. And those of you who were have long forgotten. That's too bad because so many of North America's energy and climate challenges today can be traced back to that one pivotal year and the way life imitated art in one dramatic film. Yes, the year was 1979 and the film was The China Syndrome. Set in California's fictional Ventana nuclear plant, for those of you who don't remember, The China Syndrome starred Jane Fonda as a television reporter, Michael Douglas as her cameraman, and Daniel Valdez as her sound man. The movie opened with the three of them being escorted to the observation window overlooking the control room at the nuclear reactor. They were going to do a feature on it for the local TV. Michael Douglas is told not to film, but surreptitiously does so anyway. Suddenly, there's a panic in the control room. A close-up of a water cooler shows bubbles floating to the top. There is a vibration. What the hell is that, asks the ship's supervisor, played by Jack Lemmon. 
and alarm sounds. He taps a gauge, which quickly changes to show the level of coolant to be low. We have a serious condition, he says. The panic staff watches the gauge as it appears that the reactor core could be exposed. Eventually, the coolant returns to normal, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. In the editing room back at the TV station, Douglas shows his film to his colleagues, but his producer refuses to air it for fear of a lawsuit. Leaving the station after the evening news, Fonda is told that Douglas has run away with the film and has to get it back. She finds Douglas in a screening room showing the movie to physics, a physics professor and a nuclear engineer. The engineer says it looks as if the reactor's core indeed may have come close to exposure. The professor says that it could have led to the China syndrome. If the nuclear core is exposed, he says, the fuel heats up and nothing can stop it. It'll melt through the bottom of the plant all the way to China. The professor then adds ominously these words. This would render an area the size of Pennsylvania uninhabitable. In the film's final scenes, Fonda, Douglas, and Lemon commandeer the control room, locking it from the inside, and begin to broadcast an expose of the plant's dangers. Security guards break in and kill Lemon. Suddenly, the room begins to shake violently, though. Part of the cooling system begins to crack apart again, but the reactor holds. The movie ends with Fonda on live TV saying, I'm convinced that what happened tonight was not the action of a drunk or crazy man. Jack Goodall, Jack Lemon, was about to present evidence that he believed would show this plant should be shut down. Now, why do I tell this story? Because films often express our unspoken fears. The movie The China Syndrome first appeared in American movie theaters on March 16, 1979. Twelve days later, twelve days later, on March 28, 1979, the worst nuclear accident in American history took place at Metropolitan Edison's nuclear power plant known as Three Mile Island Unit 2 outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. An incorrect reading of equipment at the Three Mile Island plant made the control operators overestimate the amount of coolant covering the plant's nuclear core. In reality, the coolant was low, leaving half the core's reactor exposed. Had the situation not been brought under control, the melting fuel core could have cracked open the reactor vessel and containment walls, leading to the China syndrome. Radiation would have spewed out into the air and would have done exactly what that professor in the movie warned, quote, rendered an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. As in the movie, Three Mile Island ended without a single person being killed or seriously injured. But that movie, the coincidence of that movie and the actual Three Mile Island meltdown had a huge fundamental effect on both America's energy future and environment. Because at the time, America led the world in nuclear power. We had 104 nuclear plants. And from the day of Three Mile Island going forward, no nuclear power plant was ever again approved in America since 1979. Now, for, for some of you, that's great. For others, it's a problem. I know you represent a lot of different industries. But the fact is this, that as a result, because we didn't compensate with energy efficiency, our dependence on fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, natural gas, reached a whole new level in the subsequent 30 years. But 1979 was far from over. Geopolitically, two things also happened in quick succession that year. The first was the Iranian Revolution, and the second was the Mecca Mosque takeover in Saudi Arabia. And the combination of the Iranian Revolution bringing an Islamic fundamentalist government to power in Iran, and the Mecca Mosque affair in Saudi Arabia, extremists trying to take over Mecca, which tilted the Saudi government onto a much more fundamentalist path. And both of them combining to create instability in the Middle East that drove up oil prices, fundamentally changed the geopolitics of the Middle East. It created a global competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia, over which was the most legitimate Muslim power in the world, and this competition 
was fundamentally funded with a whole new level of oil prices. It reshaped the Middle East and it reshaped the Muslim world. But it's hard to believe 1979 was still just getting started because 1979 was the year Margaret Thatcher was elected prime minister in Great Britain. And Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan subsequently really tilted the Western world on this path called globalization, which vastly increased energy usage and consumption also over the next 30 years. But if that wasn't enough, less noticed but equally important, in 1979, it was three years after Mao Zedong's death, China's government for the first time permitted small farmers to raise their own crops on individual lots and sell the surplus for their own profit. This agricultural reform started in the countryside in 1978, but in 1979, capitalism broke out in China's rural farms for the first time into the broader economy. In 1979, the first business license in China was given to Zhang Humei, a 19-year-old daughter of a worker in a state umbrella factory who illegally sold trinkets from a table but wanted to conduct her business legally. In a story about this, a reconstruction in the Times of London, it noted that Zhang is now a dollar millionaire and head of the Humai Garment Accessory Company, a supplier of many of the world's buttons. On her initial sale, she said, the first thing I sold was a toy watch. It was a sunny morning in May 1978. I bought it for 15 won and sold it for 20. It was very, very exciting to make a profit, but I was also very nervous and very afraid the local government staff would stop it. When the government granted her a business license in 1979, the shift of 1.3 billion people from communism to capitalism started on its way. That shift has dramatically increased both global energy demand and the amount of greenhouse gases being pumped into the atmosphere as well. On January 7, 2010, China's People's Daily reported that a total of 16.7 million vehicles were sold in China last year, bringing the country's total vehicles to more than 186 million, about half of which are motorcycles. In 1979, virtually no Chinese owned a private car. One final notable event happened in 1979. It drew almost no attention. America's National Academy of Sciences raised its first warning about something called global warming. In a 1979 study called the Charney Report, the Academy stated that if carbon dioxide continues to increase, we find no reason to doubt that climate changes will result and no reason to believe that these changes will be negligible. I retell this story of 1979 because it truly was the year that propelled us as a world community onto a high energy, high fossil fuel growth loop that it would turn out was not only environmentally unsustainable, but economically unviable, geopolitically lethal, and climatologically downright dangerous. It took almost 30 years to make that obvious, but in 2008, the full costs of 1979 became undeniable. I would argue that 2008, a year we think that's just about the subprime crisis, was more than that. 2008 was the year that both the market and Mother Nature got together and issued us a warning. You are growing in an unsustainable way environmentally and economically. Turn back now. This is your warning heart attack. That is what the Great Recession really was about. How were we growing? What was the system? Very simple. We were building more and more stores to sell more and more stuff, to be made in more and more Chinese factories, powered by more and more coal. To earn China more and more dollars, to buy more and more T-bills, to be recirculated back to America, to sell more and more stuff in more and more stores, to be made in more and more Chinese factories, powered by more and more coal, to earn China more and more dollars, to buy more and more T-bills, to be recirculated back to America, to build more and more, I could do this all night, I won't, don't worry. Now we all have had our aha moments when we met this loop in real life. For me, when I was visiting my hometown in Minneapolis a few years ago and talking about this problem with a friend of mine, 
Ken Greer, and at one point Ken simply interrupted me and said, Tom, there's something I have to show you. So we drove out to a small strip mall off Highway 494 and Route 169 outside of Minneapolis. Okay, look at this, Ken said as we drove in. And it was hard to myth, miss. On both sides of the entrance to this little strip mall were caribou coffee shops, the Minnesota version of Starbucks. Now how could one small strip mall need two caribou coffee shops? So we went into the one on the right of the entrance. I ordered my skim latte and asked the barista, explain something to me. You're a caribou coffee, and there's another one right over there. I can see it from here. Why are there two caribou coffees less than 100 yards apart? Well, she explained it was very simple. There were long lines here every morning, so we needed another one. I see, I said to myself, because people had to wait in line a little longer at rush hour in the morning for their coffee. They couldn't just add another coffee machine. They had to build a whole carbon copy coffee shop next door. Why not? Money was cheap, resources were available. Why not have two of the same coffee shop in the same strip mall? What was true for coffee shops was true for malls, as we all know, and was true for houses. What made this access possible was this whole distorted growth loop. In fact, we were, what made this distorted growth loop possible is that we were practicing the exact same accounting, faulty accounting, I would argue, in both the market and Mother Nature on the basis of the same faulty values in both the market and Mother Nature. And let me talk about that for a second. What do I mean by bad accounting? In both the market and Mother Nature, we were massively underpricing risk, privatizing gains, and socializing losses. In the market, we allowed people to massively underprice the risk of issuing subprime mortgages, credit default swaps, CDOs, and that whole nexus of financial instruments. We allowed people who did that to privatize the gains, and when they all blew up in 2008, we socialize the losses on the back of every taxpayer. We've actually been doing the exact same accounting in nature. We allow people to massively underprice the risk of emitting carbon molecules. We allow people to um, reap those gains, all of us from cheap coal and cheap oil, and we are socializing the burden of that in the form of carbon molecules in the atmosphere that our children will pay for down the road. In both the market and Mother Nature, we are practicing the identical faulty accounting, underpricing risk, privatizing gains, and socializing losses. And that is why, my friends, it is not an accident, it is not an accident that in 2008, in the same year, Citibank Iceland's banks and the biggest ice bank in Antarctica all melted at the same time. And that's why it is not an accident that Bear Stern and the polar bear both faced extinction at the same time. Because in both the market and mother nature, we are practicing the exact same accounting. But as I said, this was not just faulty accounting. There was also behind it a breakdown in values. The whole credit bubble was built on the twin principles of IBG and YBG. I'll be gone or you'll be gone when things go bad. The mortgage broker who first sold the mortgage and then passed it off to a bigger financial institution, whether it's called Fannie Mae or Citibank, knew that if the buyer defaulted, I'll be gone. Or he told the buyer, if you discover you can't play, pay your mortgage, no problem, you'll be gone. If you can't make the payments, you'll flip the house. The rating agencies whose fees and incomes depended on how many of these bonds they got to rate had a great incentive to give them high ratings so they would sell more easily and therefore investment banks would buy them and use their rating services and if the bonds blew up, no problem, IBG, I'll be gone. The investment banks had a great incentive just to turn out more and more bundles of these mortgages and sell them around the world because the fees were huge as long as they didn't hold too many on their own balance sheets. And if they blew up, who cared? IBG, I'll be gone. 
To put it another way, the whole system depended on a breakdown in ethics and accountability between borrowers, brokers, lenders, and investors. People who never should have been taking out mortgages took them out. People who never should have granted them granted them. People who never should have bundled them bundled them. People who never should have rated them AAA rated them AAA. People who never should have sold them to pension funds and banks sold them. And companies that never should have insured them insured them. We've been practicing the same IBG, YBG principles in nature which is why the World Wildlife Fund in 2008 Living Planet Report concluded that we are operating 25% above the planet's biological capacity to support life on Earth. No problem. I'll be gone. As WWF Director General observed, the world is currently struggling with the consequences of overvaluing its financial assets, but a more fundamental crisis looms ahead an ecological credit crunch caused by undervaluing the environmental assets that are the basis of all life and prosperity. Most of us are propping up our current lifestyles and our economic growth by drawing, increasingly overdrawing, on the ecological capital of other parts of the world. But then what do we care? WBG will be gone. This faulty accounting and these pernicious values of IBG and YBG were propelled, I would argue, by a deeper value shift in the society. And it is a move from sustainable values to situational values. Kurt Anderson described this shift vividly in Time Magazine in an essay in 2009 entitled The End of Excess, when he wrote in the early 1980s, around the time Ronald Reagan became president and Wall Street's great modern bull market began, we started gambling and winning and thinking magically. It's as if we decided that Mardi Gras and Christmas are so much fun, we ought to make them a year-round way of life. And we started living large, literally, as well as figuratively. From the beginning of the end of the long boom, the size of the average new house increased by one half. Meanwhile, the average American gained about a pound a year so that an adult of a given age is now at least 20 pounds heavier than someone the same age back then. In the late 70s, 15% of Americans were obese, now one-third. Delayed gratification came to seem quaint and unnecessary, even if deep down everyone knew that the spiral of over-leveraging and overspending on houses and stocks were unsustainable. Nobody wanted the party to end. As business philosopher Dove Seidman put it, there are really, friends, just two kind of values in the world, sustainable values and situational values. Sustainable values say, I will always behave in a way that sustains, sustains relationships, sustains the, sustains the environment, or sustains the institution I am working for. Situational values say, I do whatever the situation allows. If situationally I can give you a mortgage, even though you buying a million dollar home and you can only show $10,000 in income, I do it. I do it. Sustainable values would tell me I shouldn't. If situationally I can plow up part of the Amazon and, point and plant coffee there, situationally I can do it. Sustainable values tell me I shouldn't. We have gone through a huge shift, a generational shift, from a generation that behaved by sustainable values to a generation that is behaving by situational values. And this really underlies the faulty accounting that we have been exhibiting in both the market and mother nature. And that brings us to 2009. If 2008 was our warning heart attack, how did we respond in 2009? Did we go on a diet, start exercising? Basically, we kept on smoking and gaining weight and started to actively ignore the doctor's advice. And the analogy here to smoking is not accidental. You'll recall in November 2009, the server at the Climate Research Center at the University of East Anglia was hacked on November 20. And all these emails were put out. Friends, we have to be I have to be honest with you, that whole email thing, which was totally bogus, but it had a huge impact on the climate debate after 2009. 
a huge and pernicious impact because the, the, the message it gave out that somehow there was some crazy global conspiracy between climate science to hype the whole notion of climate change and global warming. That message was spread far and wide. And it came at a time of economic distress when it fell on way too many sympathetic ears. And it came at a time of weakness, at least in America, in the Obama administration, which fundamentally failed, fundamentally failed to speak out in favor of the science. The president's climate team, I'm sorry to say, there are endangered species I've seen more in the last two years than that climate team speaking out in defense of climate science and scientists. And Joe Rahm here, a wonderful climate blogger, I think got it right. The climate skeptics have taken a page right out of the tobacco industry's book. As Joe notes, when the whole smoking causes cancer issue came up, the tobacco industry figured out that it didn't have to win the debate. It just had to sow enough doubt to pollute what people thought. It was, I don't have to convince you that I'm right, I just have to convince you that the other guy may be wrong. The tobacco people wrote a famous memo that said, doubt is our product. It's a much easier threshold to meet. Doubt is the product of the climate skeptic community, and it's selling very, very well, I am sorry to report. And that brings us to 2010, when we really started to see, I think, the impact of that on policy. As you know, President Obama's party lost the by-election. They lost control of the House of Representatives. That ended the whole effort for a cap-and-trade bill. And as a result, where we are now today is that there will be no energy legislation, let alone clean, clean energy legislation, at the earliest, barring some uh, hopefully not catastrophic event, at the earliest until 2013. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about what that means for all you. But what that means for us right now is this. Those of us who are hoping for a green revolution in this administration are going to be disappointed. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about Mr. Friedman. We're having a green revolution. I read about it in the Air Canada Sky Miles magazine on my way up here. I always love when people tell me that. We're having a green revolution, really? Us having a green revolution? Have you ever been to a revolution where no one gets hurt? That's the green revolution we're having. In our green revolution, everybody's a winner. Sure. ExxonMobil's a winner. I read about it on the op-ed page of the New York Times. Their little ad. General Motors a winner. They finally put a yellow, little yellow cap on the flex fuel Hummer. BP's a winner. They stood for Beyond Petroleum. We're all winners. That's not a revolution, friends. That's a party. Okay? We've been having a green party. And I got to tell you, I, I really like it. I get invited to all the parties, but it has nothing to do whatsoever with a revolution. You'll know the revolution is here when three things happen. First, companies have to change or die. So I covered a real revolution. That was, I covered the IT revolution. Their whole group of IT companies, DEC, Data General, they're not with us anymore. They're in that great IT heaven in the sky because they did not change and so they died. That was a real revolution. Second, you'll know this is a real revolution when you have to, when you get to change the name of your movement, when the word green disappears. That's our goal. We want the word green to disappear. There'll be no green building council. There's just a building council and you won't be able to build it build it unless it's at the highest levels of energy efficiency and sustainability. There'll be no such thing as a car and a green car. There'll just be a car and you won't be able to build it unless it's at the highest levels of efficiency and sustainability. 
Our goal and the revolution will be here when the word green disappears. That is our goal, okay? And I hope I'm here for that convention. But to get there, and this is the last way we'll know that the revolution is real, we need a price signal, okay? Have no illusions about that. Price matters. At Coleman Toyota in Bethesda, where I lived when gasoline was four and a half, five dollars a gallon, they, you could not get a Toyota hybrid Prius. You had to put your name on a waiting list and they eventually stopped taking names. When gasoline falls to two dollars a gallon, you cannot sell a Toyota hybrid Prius. Price matters. But price matters with the green revolution so much more than the IT revolution for one fundamental reason and we can never lose sight of this. The IT revolution gave you a whole new function. You went from a typewriter to a laptop. You went from carbon paper to a fax machine. You got a whole new function and as a result, you were ready to pay anything for that leap forward. The one weakness of the green revolution and why we need a price signal is that at the end of the day, you still just end up with the same heating and cooling, the same mobility, and the same light. It doesn't give you a new function. And this, if you take one message away from this talk, please take this lesson. Without a price signal, we do not get long-term fixed durable consumer demand. What we get is a lot of government push Government push is important, but it's not sustainable. Now, my teacher at Caltech, Nate Lewis, has a, has a way of explaining this, which I find very, very helpful, the difference between the IT revolution and the green revolution. Let's imagine for a minute, imagine for a minute that I invented the world's first cell phone. And I came to my friend, Koki, and I said, Koki, I have a phone you can carry in your pocket. What would Koki say? She'd say, Tom, a phone I can carry in my pocket so I can report and call and call home and keep in touch? That would change my life. It would give me a whole new set of functions I've never had before. A phone I can carry in my pocket, I'll take 10. I say, wait a minute, Koki. This thing called a cell phone, they cost $1,000 each. What would Koki say? No problem, Tom. It would change my life. I sell one to her, one to him, one to you, one to her, one to him, one to her. You know what happens. I'm back here six months later. My cell phone now only costs $500 and weighs half the price. Why? Because I'm moving down the cost volume manufacturing curve. Remember, oil, coal, and gas are commodities. The more demand you create for a commodity, the more the price goes up. Solar, solar lights, efficient buildings, efficient water systems and cooling systems. Those are technologies. The more demand you create for a technology, the more the price goes down. I love my friend Koki. Year later, I call her up. I say, Koki, how did that cell phone work out for you? Oh, Tom, changed my life. Got another deal for you, Koki. Got another deal for you, Koki. See the lights at the Green Build Convention? We're going to power those lights this year with solar power. We're going to power them with solar power. How much would it cost, Tom? Oh, it's going to cost them $1,000 more a day. What would Koki say? She'd say, Tom, Tom, Tom. Tom, remember, you spoke here last year. We already have light, and we really don't care where the photons and electrons come from. So unless the government of this fine city comes along and says, from now on at this center, you're gonna to have to pay the fully burdened cost of those lights. You're gonna to have to pay the cost of the CO2 in the atmosphere, the cost of transporting the oil, the burning the coal. Oh, and from now on, those lights are gonna cost you 1,500 event. Oh, when that happens, when that happens, Koki's back on her cell phone, which now costs $25 and clips to her ear, and says, Tom, your solar lights, I'll take 10. That's how it happens. No price signal, 
No sustained consumer pull. Finally, friends, it really brings me to where we are now. I started out by describing to you a loop that started in 1979 and really shaped our energy consumption usage for the last 30 years. We are now seeing the start of a different energy, environment, sustainability loop, two of them that are interacting and I think will shape the future. The first element of this loop is the rise in food prices. Remember, world food prices, according to the World Food Organization, hit a all-time record high when in December 2010. What also happened in December 2010? The Arab Spring started in Tunisia. That is not an accident. Higher food prices then lead to greater instability, which lead to higher oil prices. Higher oil prices then feed back into fertilizer and lead to higher food prices. Higher food prices drive more political instability and lead to higher oil prices. Higher oil prices then feed back. That is the loop that actually is underlying a lot of the Arab Spring. Around that is a bigger loop called hot, flat, and crowded. We're seeing a massive increase in population in Egypt. Think about one country. There were 20 million people in Egypt in the early 20th century. There are 88 million today. What's more, God bless them, more and more of them want to lead an American-style life, live an American-sized home, drive an American-sized car, eat American-sized Big Macs. So the world is not only getting crowded, but it's getting flat, flat in the sense that people can see how each other live and want to live like they live. And it's getting crowded. And when hot, flat, and crowded all start to work together, with flat and crowded driving the hot, you have an outer loop driving the inner loop, because then you have more climate change, which affects more agriculture, more agricultural decline affects Political stability, political stability affects oil prices, so these two loops are now completely intertwined. And that really brings me to the challenge we have today as a generation. We need to be the regeneration. The regeneration that designs a virtuous cycle to compete with this vicious cycle. And I think we know how to do it. It starts with ever-rising efficiency standards. We've seen the impact that's happened in California from rising standards on everything from refrigerators to homes and commercial buildings. But higher standards have to be reinforced by a price signal. And that price signal and higher standards will then drive more investment in research and innovation. That is the counter loop to all of this. But how do we get there? I thought a lot about that before I came up here today. Because I don't like to be downbeat, and this isn't meant to be downbeat, but it's meant to be realistic. We who believe in energy efficiency, protecting the environment, and trying to move the economy to a clean power system. We've had a couple of bad years here. And it seems to me we need to sit back and realize this environment, political economic environment, is not going to change, is not going to change overnight. And therefore, every one of us here has to think about how we bring more imagination, okay, more imagination to everything we do around this industry to work within these constraints. Now, it may seem like a fool's errand. It may seem unrealistic. But we have to understand these constraints are not going away. I wish I could tell you a price signal was coming. It's not. I wish I could tell you higher standards on a national level are coming, I doubt they will be. 
But here's why I remain an optimist. Because what I found in going around the country, talking about this issue to groups when Hot, Flat, and Crowded came out, is that there is an amazing amount of innovation going on in this country, in Canada and America, from the ground up. And I see it here in this hall. I'm, I'm frankly, a, I'm amazed that you're all here. And you know why I think you're all here? You're, you're all here for the most important reason to be optimistic. You just didn't get the word. God bless you, okay? You just didn't get the word that we're not going to have a price signal, that the politics is all paralyzed, that we're, you know, fighting with each other from one end of Washington, Pennsylvania Avenue to the other. You just didn't get the word. You are like a Marine we interviewed for our new book that used to be us when we asked him, why did you surge in Anbar province? He said we were too dumb to quit. Thank you all for being too dumb to quit, okay? Do not get the word, okay? Please don't get the word, because if you get the word, the word's kind of grim right now. But honestly, you know, as I've gone around and spoken about this book to different groups and people, I'm always struck at the end of my talk, I do a book signing, people will come up and give me their business cards, green innovators, so many people, doing exciting things in this place. I hear crazy ideas. Mr. Friedman, I, I've got a duck. It paddles a wheel, blows up a balloon, issues methane, turns a turbine. I hear the craziest stuff. But you know what it tells me? It tells me the country is alive from the bottom up with people who did not get the word. I go back to my room, hotel room at events like this, and I empty my pockets out from, with, with, with business cards from energy innovators and entrepreneurs. Rock stars get room keys, I get business cards, but they're very exciting to me. Because it tells me the country is alive from the ground up, that there are so many people too dumb to quit. I wish I could tell you that some quick solution from the national level is coming, it's not. We are where we are, we've got what we've got. It's on you. It's on me. It's on us. They're not going to solve it for us. So promise me you will keep on going and you will never get the word. Thank you very much. Thank you.